So today we are wrapping up our series called Talking Points, the perfect blend of politics and religion. And this is a series that was uh, originally done by a pastor named Andy Stanley uh, from North Point Ministries in Georgia. And uh, Andy gave us permission uh, to kind of take this series and import it into Canada. And so a big thanks goes to Andy for letting us be able to do this, uh, because this is a series that is important for us. Uh, Politics is a topic uh, that matters to all of us. Now, you might be sick of politics. You might be sick of it being 24-7 on the news these last few days, and maybe you're ready to just get past it. And I have good news for you, because next Sunday we are starting a brand new series that has nothing to do with politics at all. But Today, we are going to finish off this series talking about politics because politics is something that we're going to talk about in our homes, in our workplaces, with family, with friends. Uh, And so why not talk about it in the church too? Because one of my beliefs is that the church should be the safest place to talk about anything, including politics. See, Everyone has different experiences and different understandings in a different place on the political spectrum where um, you may find yourself comfortable, and that is normal. In fact, that is a good thing about any group, about any church, that we would have people from all ranges of the political spectrum that are coming together to know who Jesus is and to live out our faith together. But that does mean that when these topics come up, we need to talk about them in ways that are safe, in ways that are encouraging, and in ways that put our faith first. Because Jesus, he didn't come to take sides. In fact, in the first century, people were always trying to get Jesus to choose sides, but sides, but he refused to. In fact, Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to introduce the kingdom of God. He came to introduce a new way of understanding our faith, a way of paving a new path for us to have a relationship with God. And when Jesus came to do this, we call it the gospel. The good news for everyone is that Jesus came and made a path for us to be in a relationship with God, and we celebrate that. And that is what Jesus came for, this, to build this kingdom of God, not to partner with an earthly political party of the first century. And Jesus had, this, had his own agenda, his own plan, his own purpose why he came. And later on after Jesus, there was a guy named Paul, and Paul was an apostle, which meant he was a church planter, uh, he was an evangelist, he was one of the early church leaders, and Paul had this way of summarizing what Jesus came to do. He had this kind of shorthand phrase that he used that we introduced last week called the law of Christ, this new kind of rule and way of understanding our faith. And we looked at that in Paul's letter to the church of Galatia where he writes this, he says, share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. And when he says obey the law of Christ, he's referring to Jesus's command that he gave to his disciples on the last evening he had together with them, where he told them to love one another as Jesus had loved them. And so when Paul says, when you share each other's burdens in this way, you are obeying the law of Christ. He's saying when you walk with each other through difficult times, when you encourage and support one another, when you spend time facing what is challenging together, you are acting out this command from Jesus to love one another as Jesus has loved us. And what we realize When we carry someone's burdens, when we walk with someone through difficult circumstances, is that even if we are on one side of the political spectrum and they're on the other, um, what we realize is that when we choose to carry someone's burden, what divides us diminishes and what unites us surfaces. We start to realize that we have more in common with one another when we walk through difficult times together. We start to realize that we have more in common than different when we carry someone else's burden, when we walk together through difficult times. And we're not as different from one another as we think. And when we do this, we are being shaped by the same thing that shaped the early church, this law of Christ, this command to love one another, to not be divided, to not be divisive, to not be separated, but instead be brought together in unity. And that leads us to this guiding question that we've had through this series, where we've been asking, are we willing to put our faith filters ahead of our political filters? Meaning, as followers of Jesus, for those of us who have committed our lives to Christ, 
Are we willing to, when we look at politics, look at our faith first? Can we be a Jesus follower before being a liberal or a conservative or a green or an NDP or a Republican or a Democrat or whatever label you want to put on yourself politically? Are we willing to see ourselves as a Jesus follower first? Because when faith comes before our political leanings, we are able to do so much more and we are actually able to live out that law of Christ so much better. And so here's what I want to convince you of today. Here's what I want to share with you and dive into through this lens of unity and not being divided. Is that we do the world a disfavor when we attempt to wrap our political ideologies within the teachings of Jesus. So what I mean by that is when we take our political ideology when we take our political beliefs, which as we talked about last week, are shaped by things we don't control a lot more than we recognize. If we take our political ideologies and we try to shove them and merge them and meld them into the teachings of Jesus, we actually do the world and ourselves a disfavor. Jesus did not come to be a footnote to a political platform because the political parties that existed in Jesus' day, they don't exist anymore. And the political parties that exist now, they may not exist a hundred years from now. And Jesus did not come to support the established political systems of the day, or even of this day. In fact, Jesus is the king who came to reverse the order of things. He flipped the whole system upside down on its head, and that's why he didn't fit in with any of their sides. In fact, That's why I believe and I'm committed to that those of us who are followers of Jesus cannot be first and foremost party people, meaning our first identity is not our political affiliations. We must be kingdom people, meaning we are influenced by Jesus and we are foremost Jesus people. We must be kingdom people who use our influence to influence our party. Now, what I mean by that is that When we are forced to choose between imperfect candidates, we need to call out those imperfections. We need to study and look and observe and see where every political party has pieces of their platform that do not line up with the kingdom that Jesus came to create on earth. Now, Jesus' kingdom is not going to be achieved by political means. But we live in a world where politics is a reality and politics affects us, and so When we look at politics, we can't just think about our own sake, but what about the world's sake? If this law of Christ means we must love one another as Jesus has loved us, when we look at our political affiliations, we we cannot think about what is only best for me. We need to think about our world's sake. And that means that our political decisions can't be guided just by when we think there is a, a perceived issue around religious freedoms. In fact, when we see things like injustice, systemic racism, when we see inequality, we need to recognize that the same way that Jesus raised the bar for his followers, we as the people have the ability and the influence to say to our political parties, you need to raise the bar and do better. You need to do better at these things that are bigger kingdom issues than just focusing on single issue topics to try and garner my vote. See, we should be willing to push our political leaders on the hard questions and say, we want you to raise the bar and do what is better for all of us, not just what you think will get me to check off beside your name. See, this refusal to just go along with the established way things are politically is, in fact, when we look at the early church, caused many of them to lose their lives. See, early church early Christians, early members of the church, lost their lives over refusing to give unconditional allegiance to Roman emperors and even the good ones. Even the Roman emperors that we look at in history go, oh, you know, that guy wasn't so bad. He he wasn't too bad. He only killed that many Christians. The early church refused to give their unconditional allegiance to the Roman emperor the way that people who weren't part of the early church did and what was common in the first century and common in other nations outside of the Roman Empire as well. But what this did, what this caused, is that the early church, because of this refusal, because they raised the bar, 
they were able to move the moral and ethical needle of a nation. They were able to plant the seeds and start the things in motion that led to our Western understanding of justice and fairness and equality, things that we still need to do better on. But it was the early church that started pushing Rome in that direction. And how they did that is something that Andy terms this way. He calls it culturally disruptive unity. Now, you might see disruptive and unity put together like that and say, well, wait, what does this mean? How can you be disruptive and united at the same time? And what Andy means by this, and and what I see when I look at the early church as well, is that the unity of the early church was so strong. They were so committed to this law of Christ. They were so committed to loving one another, so committed to sharing each other's burdens, that they disrupted the culture that surrounded them. They disrupted the culture that they were part of. Now, the world typically organizes around wealth, power, and citizenship. That's the way the Roman emperor worked. If you had wealth, if you had power, if you had citizenship, you could do whatever you wanted. You could gather a following. You could live a pretty nice life. But the early church didn't organize themselves around wealth, power, and citizenship. Instead, what they did caused them to be viewed as disturbing and dangerous. They were viewed as a threat to the entire Roman Empire because of what they did. And what the church did that was so radically different was this law of Christ. To love one another as Jesus loves them, they looked at that and said, that means everyone matters to God. See, Roman society was very stratified. There was layers and circles of social classes upon social classes. Even down to the garments you wore indicated what social class you were part of. And those circles and layers of society did not interact with each other. But in the church, they came together. And classes of people whose circles rarely overlapped came together voluntarily and regularly to worship the crucified and resurrected God. And this was basically offensive to Rome. This is what the church did that was so disruptive. And Paul, Jesus' good news for everyone is the message that Paul carries forward as he plants churches, as he writes letters. And in the letter to the Galatian church, just a little bit earlier than the verse we read before, he writes this. He says, There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He looks at this church, this church that is made up of people of all different social classes, the only place in society where this happens, and he says, You are all one in Christ. Christ. What this meant is that everyone in Jesus has equal value and dignity. This is how the early church was so disruptive and so threatening to Rome. And this message that everyone has equal value before God spread like wildfire. In fact, Jesus predicted that this would happen. In the Gospel of Luke, It's recorded that Jesus uh, is speaking and he says to his followers this, he says, until John the Baptist, until John the Baptist, the law of Moses and the messages of the prophets, that means the old covenant law, the Torah law, uh, what we call now our Old Testament, that was your guides. But now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is eager to get in. And that's what the early church saw. They were preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. They were preaching that people were equal and had value to God. They were living out this law of Christ. They were being faithful and caring. And it was spreading like wildfire. The early church grew rapidly. And Rome started to see this more and more like a threat. So much so that 45 years after Paul's execution... There is a governor of an area of the Roman Empire called Bithynia, which is now part of modern-day Turkey. And this guy's name was Pliny the Younger, which separated him from his uncle, Pliny the Elder. And Pliny the Younger is the governor of this area, and he has been instructed to interrogate and persecute and execute Christians. And he is kind of struggling with this, and he doesn't really understand why. And so what he does is he decides to investigate these Christians. And we don't know if it was him himself, or maybe he sent an aide to kind of be a spy and to follow up and go to some of these Christian 
gatherings. And this is what he writes in his letter to the emperor, asking the emperor, what do I do about this? Here's what he writes. He says, of these early Christians, he says, they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God. He's saying that they are gathering and they, the church, early church gathered on Sunday, which at that point was a work day, not a day off. So they're gathering before dawn on a work day. If you think church uh, Sundays at 11 is early, you know, church could have been Monday at 6 a.m. I'm glad we're not doing that. But he says they get together and they sing a hymn to Christ as to a God. He's saying they're singing a hymn to this Christ Jesus as though Christ Jesus is a God. Now, Pliny isn't a Christian. He doesn't view Jesus as God the way the early church did and the way we do now. But here's what he goes on. He says, this is what they do. They gather to sing a hymn, and he says, and to bind themselves by oath, not to some crime, but not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery, and not to falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so. He's saying when the church gathers, they are making commitments to follow the law and care for one another. And what he does not understand is how this group of Christians who's making those commitments to follow the law and care for each other was able to threaten the stability of the entire Roman Empire. Pliny didn't get it. But he couldn't understand this because he was so ingrained in a culture that worshipped strength, victory, conquest, wealth, and power. And here is this group of Christians who worship a crucified God, a God who willingly chose his own execution because of what it would achieve for us, a God who rose from the dead and appeared to his followers and then ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father so that the Father could send the Holy Spirit to empower and equip the church. Pliny couldn't understand that. See, to the Roman elite, including guys like Pliny, Worshiping a crucified God was appalling. They could not understand that. But for many, the upside-down kingdom of Jesus was appealing. In fact, some estimates say that by 300 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, one-third of the Roman Empire is Christian. In fact, the kingdom of Jesus became contagious. It spread like wildfire. People were committing their lives to this type of living, to living with a shared moral conscience, to being guided by this law of Christ, to sharing one another's burdens, to seeing people as equals. And this was scary to the ruling powers and political powers of the day. And then what happened in 313 AD under Constantine the Great Constantine issues the Edict of Milan, which grants Christianity protected status. It grants Christianity protection from persecution. It means that churches don't have to be in hiding anymore, that churches are free to gather openly. They don't have to worry about being interrogated and persecuted. And why Constantine did this is, is there's a lot of debate around it. Some say that he had a genuine conversion experience. Some say it was out of a realization that he would have to execute a third of his empire. And we don't know what his intentions or motivations were. But what we do know happened was that as Christianity received official status, Jesus' teachings about disruptive unity and equality were corrupted by political powers and authorities. And I'm going to summarize about 1,700 years of church history into just a few sentences, so forgive me for the oversimplifications on this. But what we begin to see throughout history, when Christianity is granted official protection, it becomes the official state religion a short while after that. Christianity becomes a means of protecting wealth and power and citizenship. Christianity starts to lose its way in some areas. And in fact, when the teachings of Jesus get wrapped in this political filter, the end result is rarely a recognizable form of Jesus' command to love one another. But there is some hope. 
There is hope in this because even despite that, even times when the church became essentially married to politics and power and married and became an agent of the state, there were still remnants all along. Jesus did not give up on the church that he promised to build. The Holy Spirit did not give up on the church. And all throughout history, there are pockets and remnants of people that were pleading for the church to come back to this culturally disruptive unity, to come back to the law of Christ, to come back to what we are meant to be as followers of Jesus. And that happened time and time again, that the church sought to become the dissenting voice and the consciousness of a nation. And I believe that is the role that the church speaks into even today that the church has the role of the nation's consciousness to speak out for injustice, to speak out for the oppressed, to care for the widows, to care for the orphans, to be the ones who stand in the gap to make sure that people are not left behind because people are who matter to God. In fact, I've talked about this before, that the abolitionists and the civil rights movements, they had their basis in followers of Jesus who read Scripture and looked at the world and said, this doesn't match up. We need to raise the bar. We need to use our influence for good. And that is the role of politics even today. That is where the church can be involved. And what that means is we have to ask this brutally difficult question of ourselves. Are we willing to follow Jesus even when doing so creates space between us and our party's platform and candidate? You know, we all... No, anyone who has voted knows who we voted for. And again, I said at the beginning, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not going to tell you who I've ever voted for. But I know that there is space between who Jesus is and who I voted for. And I made the best, most informed decision I could and seek to say, how do we as followers of Jesus, how are we part of being this culturally disruptive, united front for good? Because fortunately for us, Jesus' promise that he would build his church is still true today. His church is what is timeless, not political systems. His church, this ecclesia, this gathered people for a purpose, not a building, not an event on Sunday, not an event that we watch online together, but the church meaning the people who are gathered for a purpose. And in this era, in this moment in time, we gather virtually. We are still gathered Because we are following the law of Christ when we are sharing in each other's burdens. When we are walking with one another through difficult situations. When we are walking our world through turmoil. When we, the church, can provide that place of stability and anchoring. And this place where we can say, this is where peace is found. This is where rest is found. This is where united, u- unity is found. This is where equality is found. As the church, we can move the needle. Not by passing legislation. Not by who we vote for, but in how we act. Now, who we vote for matters. But how we act as followers of Jesus will have profoundly more impact on the world than our vote when we cast a ballot. So, we don't have to agree with everyone in order to be united with them in this. Because we can be followers of Jesus first and have our political affiliations second. And that's why through this series I've been talking about it in this way that as followers of Jesus, we can disagree politically, we can love unconditionally, and we can pray for culturally disruptive unity. We can pray for a unity that disrupts our culture and disrupts our world. Because that is the church's legacy. And that is the history that we have inherited And the history that we get to continue to walk forward and gets to be our legacy moving forward as well. That the church can move the needle on the nation. Together, we can make our nations a lot less divided than they are. And when I talk about praying for cultural disruptive unity, one of the most culturally disruptive things we can do is we can pray for the political leaders 
we have, whether we voted for them or not. Whether we support their policies, their platform, their legislation or not, we can pray for them. So we can pray for our political leaders. We can pray that they would experience God's love because they are someone who is loved by God. And even in this situation, in this time today where our political leaders are under the microscope, where every action, every word they say is being dissected and chopped up and, and taken to the extremes at times, and whether or not we think their decisions are good or bad, we can do the culturally disruptive thing and we can pray for them. And so I want to encourage you to do that. That this week, when you uh, read one of the government updates, when you maybe watch one of the live streams that our provincial government does, or you see on the news uh, talk about what's happening in the U.S. politics or what's happening in our own Canadian politics here, will you commit to pray for them? And as we do that, we can disagree with one another politically. Now, as we said last week, we should try to seek to understand each other, but it's okay to disagree because our political positions have been shaped by our environment, environmental factors more than we know. But the important ones is to love unconditionally and pray for unity. And so that brings our series, Talking Points, to a close. Um, thank you for sticking with me through this. I know that this hasn't been an easy series for us to dive into. This hasn't been easy topics to wrestle with in a time when all of us feel on overload anyways. And so next week, we are starting a series that has nothing to do with politics. We are starting a series that is about finding rest, that is about finding peace, that is about finding calmness and stillness in the midst of this world we live in. And maybe that's what we need following up three weeks talking about politics, but I hope that you'll join me and that you won't miss next Sunday as we dive into a new series together. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for joining in. And I hope you have a great Sunday and I hope you have a great week.